Again, welcome to Freedom Church International, uh, one church that exists in four locations on two continents, and I'm glad that uh, you've chosen to be with us today here in Fairhope. As John said to those of you who are joining us online, thanks so much for tuning in. We really love that you get to connect with us in that way. We are uh, currently in a series that is entitled uh, Be Ready, so we are in working our way almost to the end of 1 Thessalonians. If you've got your Bibles, I'll invite you to go ahead and turn there with me. Isaiah, as I think I may have mentioned last week, Pastor Isaiah is uh, in the area. He's actually on the eastern shore. Now this weekend, we're always honored to have him. For those of you who are guests, um, the overseer of, our, of the African campuses of our church uh, is in town for several weeks right now and uh, had an opportunity to visit with him uh, at some length already. And uh, I, I just find encouragement from thoughts like this, statements like this. I wanted to pass it on to you. He was making the point as we were eating together that every time he's with the people on the three different campuses in Nigeria, he said, I tell them over and over and over, make sure every time you gather, every time you pray, the first point of prayer every time is you pray for our brothers and sisters on the eastern shore in the United States. And uh, to just, and let me tell you, those folks know how to pray. And just to know that every time we're together, that 1,200 of our African brothers and sisters have, have gone ahead of us, a few hours ahead of us, praying over us. Boy, there's something really sweet and powerful and wonderful about stepping into ministry, stepping into worship, knowing that uh, we're covered in prayer like that. And I don't know what, uh, what your need may be today. I'm always struck as I look around the room by how we all come at just different places in our lives, different things going on with different ones of us, some at really happy, wonderful places and others feeling confused or empty or just at so many different places in life. And the good news today is this, wherever you are, Jesus knows and he cares and he truly wants you to encounter him in a way today that would meet the deepest needs in your life. And uh, thankfully, that is not dependent on a preacher And that is not dependent on singers or or anyone else. But he he does use the weakness of what we bring to bear. But uh, he is here and he wants to meet you where you are. Well, as I said, uh, we're in this series that is entitled Be Ready. Uh, I don't know if you saw the headline this week. I found it interesting. I've always been a bit of a science and space nerd. So I, I was captured by the had to read the article when I saw the headline on NBC News about how NASA had, for the first time ever, conducted a, a test run at flying a spacecraft into an asteroid to see if they could actually divert the course of the asteroid so that they could prove to themselves that if it, it was not headed toward Earth, but it was just headed in our general direction. The whole idea was... One day, if a killer asteroid was headed toward Earth, would it be possible to slam a spacecraft into it and divert its course just enough to make it miss the Earth? And you'll be relieved to know, if you didn't already read the story this week, that they succeeded. They were able to change the course of an asteroid, and NASA's going, woo we are ready now for what would be the end of the world to try and keep it from being the end of the world. They, NASA is trying to get ready, to be ready for the most cataclysmic event that we could imagine, a killer asteroid coming to the Earth. And at some level, I guess we can all go, okay, thanks for that. That's, that's nice to know that you're ready for that. Um, There are a lot of different things to be ready for in life. You know, the last couple of weeks we were talking about being ready for the return of Jesus, being ready for the end of the world as we know it. And we absolutely should consider those things on a a grand scale, being ready for that because we don't know when the time's going to come. And as important as that is, what we're going to talk about today maybe in some ways is more important. What we're going to talk about today is about being ready to do your part today. It's, it's really easy to obsess over the big things that we don't control and that may not happen in our lifetimes. And in fact, that's exactly what Paul was having to address in the church that he was writing to because these young Christians had sort of obsessed over the fact that 
the end of the world might come any day and Jesus might return at any moment. And so they were just quitting their jobs. They were ceasing to do the things that they needed to be doing on a day-to-day basis and were just focused on, we're just going to just be ready for the end of the world. And Paul was like, no, 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 no. There, there's stuff you need to be doing today. And so what we're going to talk about today is some of the stuff that's going to sound really simple and in some ways maybe basic. And I would say to you that what we'll talk about today is really foundational to what it means to be a Christian because I'll I'll remind you of this as we begin. Never forget that God's purpose in creating us, when you want to try and figure out the, the meaning of life, the purpose of God was singular when he made us. It was to form a family of people for himself. That's it. People who would be his children and who would freely welcome and honor him as their father and their God and on whom he could just lavish his love. That was his purpose in creation. So it's critically important, if that's God's primary purpose, that we learn how to function in that realm, that we learn how to function as the family of God. And that's what we're going to talk about today. That's the next thing that Paul turns his attention to. Paul has just been talking about the end of the world and the return of Jesus and the day of the Lord. And in the very next breath, this is what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other, and for everyone else. We'll draw a line and stop there. I I think I've mentioned in a previous Sunday how Paul tends to write his letters in such a way that he'll put like the the weightier theology in the front end of the letter, sort of the meatier matters of what we need to understand, and then he'll spend the second portion of the letter just giving us real practical stuff. Well, in this little short chapter that he closes the letter with, he gives 22 specific instructions. I mean, it's like machine gun fire, just bam, 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 bam. All of these instructions about, okay, if you're going to live as a Christian, you got to do this and this and this and this. And he starts with this. Here is how you've got to live and and do life in the community of faith. And so out of all the things that he said in those four verses, we can really sum it up in three things that he said to us about how we do life. And the first is this, that he said it begins with this, that you honor and support those who lead in the church. And I would add this too. You you could scratch the last three letters of, of that the last three words of that first statement on your outline and just say honor and support those who lead, period. He, he says this as he opens. Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and they give you spiritual guidance. So show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work. Whether you are thinking in terms of a church family or your biological family, or our country, whatever group God makes you a part of, a fundamental part of living in the kingdom of God is learning how to relate to others in such a way that we honor those who are in authority and that we learn to to work in line with those who are in authority. Now, I realize that in the last few decades, this whole idea and even the use of this word authority, sometimes it gets misused and oftentimes misunderstood. And so people really tend to react against that like, oh, this is some heavy handed idea. And I just want to remind you that one of the most fundamental things that God has revealed to us about how life works and how relationships work is modeled for us in the Godhead. We serve and know the one true God who eternally exists as three persons, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Godhead models for us the order that he wants to exist in all of life. That within the Trinity, all three are eternally existent. They they have been here since eternity past. All three were active in creation. And all three together rule over the world and hold all things in place. And yet within that Godhead, there is specific order. The Father is the ultimate authority the son, who didn't get birthed somewhere down the line, but he is, he is the eternal son, submits to the father in all things. 
He seeks to bring honor to the Father. He came into the world and took on human form at the behest of the Father. He came to into the world on a mission defined by the Father, and he is still fulfilling that mission. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that when he is done with this mission, what is the mission of setting all things in order and bringing them under his rule? And when he has finished doing that, putting down the rebellion and bringing everyone back into order, yielded to God, it says that he will then present the kingdom fully in order back to the Father. Sir, it is back like it was supposed to be, and it is your kingdom. He operates under the authority of the Father, and the Spirit, who eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son, seeks always to bring glory to the Father and the Son. Do you see the order in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And yet we look at that, and we go, well, does that make the Father greater than the Son and the Spirit? Does it make Him more important than or more God than? No, not at all. They are, in fact, one God. They are equally divine, but there is order in the Godhead, which is a picture of how God designed life to be. That within the family, he has defined order and places of authority and of submission, that he places children in a, in a place of protection under their parents. We, it's funny, isn't it, how as parents, we'll look at that and go, that's a blessing for the kids. That is God's way of shepherding and caring for the kids. And so it's a good thing for kids to have a mom and dad as a covering over them, and yet hasn't it gotten squirrely and weird when we start talking about husbands and wives and we talk about how God has ordered things to put a husband in a place of authority as a covering for the wife that now we're sort of like, well, wait a minute, aren't we past that now in the 21st century? Don't talk about a husband having authority over a wife. And, and I get it. I understand where that comes from because so many men have dominated women historically that there's a fear of like, well, if a woman submits to a man, what, that, what might that end up doing to her? And what we need to do is not throw the baby out with the bathwater and still hold on to this order that God has created for the family and for the church. Jesus understood how we'll pervert the whole idea of of order and authority, and he redefined the whole deal. Do you remember what he said about that? He he said to the disciples who were arguing over who's going to be greatest, because, I mean, the the disciples are just always a picture of us, aren't they, and how we think, like our, our more base sides, you know, that here Jesus is literally, he's down to the last days, he's getting ready to go to the cross, and the disciples are like, but I wonder who's going to be on his right and who's going to be on his left. I mean, I want to know who's going to have the most authority. Who is, if Jesus is the general, who's going to be the colonel? And who's going to be the the second lieutenant? Who's going to be the buck private? I mean, I'm pretty sure that Judas is going to be far down the line. You know, partly Bartholomew is going to be pretty far down the line. What can you do with a name like that, Bartholomew? I mean, they're trying to figure out who's going to be at his right and his left. We want the power. And Jesus said, guys, come on. Look around you. Don't you realize that the pagan world thinks like what you're talking about here? That they want the power to to lord it over those who are under them, but not so with you. Because the greatest among you, the one with the greatest calling of authority is to be the servant of all. You see, the world has always thought, we want to get to the top so that we control everybody who's underneath us. And Jesus said, let me tell you, if God installs you at a position up here, that in the kingdom, what we do is we turn it upside down and say, if you've been given authority over a large number of people, it means those are the people that you're supposed to serve and support as well as cover and protect. Jesus said, this is going to be a whole different picture from what you've been imagining all of your life. So it is to be in the church. And so it is. It's supposed to be this way in the family. It's supposed to be this way in the church. And that's a really healthy thing. And so I want to take a moment, just at a real practical level, spell out for you some of what that looks like in Freedom Church. We understand that God puts people in a place of authority to provide a covering for those that they're responsible for. And it, it does just that. And so I want you to know where your covering comes from. We have three real well-defined layers of authority and covering of leadership in our church. The first one in our particular fellowship 
is the small group shepherds. It is the, the small group leaders. I, I always look at the small group leaders as the primary pastors of our church. They are the most hands-on, first line of defense. So I'm going to ask our 242 leaders and other small group leaders to please stand right now and stay standing. Come on, get up. You're out there. Stand up. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly identify these because I want everybody to know who these folks are. And this is kind of hard to do with the lights, but John Ruka and Steve and Nancy Emmons, they co lead a group on uh, Wednesday nights. It's one of our newer groups that meets at Forest House. So that's one set of small group shepherds. Dave and Penny Mose, and I don't think Jim is here today, and, uh, and Jim Richards co lead a group that meets here on Tuesday evenings here at the church. Rick and Laura? Get up. Come on. Thank you very much. Rick and Laura Miller co-lead a group that this is the group that I think has been here since the foundation of the world. They've been around forever. They, uh, Penny is back there too. Bless your heart. Dave and Penny both, thank you for finally getting up. Uh, Rick and Laura co-lead a group at John and Sally's house on Wednesday nights. Uh, Charles and Laura Dodd lead a, a discovery group on Monday evenings that meets over here in the youth room, a recovery-oriented small group. Eileen Creek and Cheryl Haruska lead a ladies group on Wednesday mornings, a group that has done fabulously well and has grown to the point we're trying to figure out how to make another group because people continue to want to get into that group. My wife, who loves to be recognized in church, is not standing, but has to stand because she and I co-lead a group that meets on Monday evenings at 6 o'clock in the Grace Room. And, <laughs> and who have I? Uh, oh, well, and also John and Sally uh, co-lead with John Ruka, the group that meets on Thursday evenings in Celebrate Recovery. This is your first line of covering in the church. Thank you. You may be seated. You can show them love. The second layer of covering that we have here is those who are the pastors and ministers of the church. This is essentially your church staff, both paid and lay ministers of the church. So I'm going to ask the ones that are in the room to stand. Some of them are out serving in other parts, but some of you are scratching your heads going, am I, am I part of that list? We start with Tony, who is our worship pastor and who leads us every Sunday in that area. Uh, Beth, who is the church secretary, but also discipleship leader. Stone and Caroline, who shepherd our, our students in the 7th through the 12th grade. Um, in the back, I don't think Sabrina and Lynn are both in the back. Sabrina Ankerson, who uh, is the minister over our kids from birth to kindergarten. And Lynn Davison, who right now is leading our, leading our kids in the first through the sixth grade. Eileen, who is a part of this group, is our missions pastor. John and Sally, along with John Ruka, who are our recovery pastors. Did I miss anyone? That is your second line of covering in the church. Thank you, guys. And then we also have a body of elders who are the final covering for the church. And I'll ask you guys, we're missing one of our elders. There are four Elders in the church, yeah, John's just up and down, up and down, but uh, uh, Chris Perry, who normally is seated in that back corner but is out today, Chris Perry, Wayne Smith, John Beck, and I have the privilege of serving as elders here in the body. And so thank you guys for, for what you do. I did that not, not to give attaboys so much as to, I want you to know, oh, and by the way, I, Jerry, I missed you. You and uh, Jerry and Ken and Carol lead our Sunday morning group and do a fabulous job with the Sunday morning group that meets in the grace room. Thank you guys for what you do. But I want you to know, that, oh, oh, and also Dave and Nick who, who shepherd and oversee everything in our media ministry here in the church. Thank you guys for what you do. But I want you to know who the people are who are in these positions. And I just want to say to you, and, and I'm not blowing sunshine at you, it, it's just the truth. We have never been in a place where we have a healthier body of leadership than what we have here now. And I'm so encouraged to see people among whom there is truly a sense of unity and pulling in the same direction when we, when we meet and, and seek God's direction for where we're going. It's not a divisive thing. So this is a group that is wonderful to be a part of, but it's also wonderful to have these folks as a covering for you. And one of the healthiest signs that I see in this church 
is that things function in such a way. I mean, in so many churches, people imagine that if you need any help, you better get to the senior pastor because he's got the most spiritual juju. He's got the red phone that gets to God first. You know, the, he, he's the one that you want to get to. And it is wonderful how many times I'll discover major things that have happened, major needs that have arisen and have all been addressed, and nobody ever even said a word to me. And don't misunderstand that. It's not like I don't want to be bothered. It's just fantastic to see that you recognize that these other shepherds have got the same line to God as anybody else, that they are operating with the, the authority that God has given them. And it's a, it's a really cool thing to see the church functioning as it should. Now, the writer of Hebrews goes on to give us a, a further word of instruction in Hebrews 13, 17, when he says, Obey your leaders and act under their authority. They are watching over you because they are responsible for your souls. Obey them so that you will... So that um, they will do this work with joy and not sadness. And I just want to say to you, first of all, I, I know we sort of freak out that word obey. Like, oh, man, that sounds like they can tell you what to do. The reality is if you've been in this church for any length of time, you know there's nobody around here who wants to abuse authority or, or try and force anyone to, to do anything that they don't want to do. That the, the things that really weigh the heaviest in this are the ideas of having the responsibility of watching over others who are under their authority and that sense of responsibility for their souls. I love that God has put people in leadership roles here who take those things seriously who, and who understand the responsibility of providing that covering and praying for and truly shepherding those that God has put under our protective covering and under our leadership. Man, I, I want you to know I take this responsibility uh, very seriously. It, it really, I don't take lightly ever the responsibility of, of serving in a role of shepherding you and, and even just in terms of like the direction of the church or even what I'm supposed to be teaching on, that this is not random. We really are seeking to follow the Lord in all things and wanting to make sure that you are well fed and well led. And here's what I love about being here. You do exactly what Paul says. And it's part of what makes life at freedom so great. Like, I don't have to referee fights. Ever. Like, I can't remember the last time I ever had to, to deal with some kind of major division or conflict within the church that you function as a family and you lead and support and, and, and love well those who lead you. So thank you for the way that you do what you do. You make it a joy. And I speak for the leaders who've stood here today in saying it is a joy to get to serve you. And so one, one final word I'll give before we move on. Paul said in 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, I urge that prayers and intercessions be made for all of those in authority. If I could ask for one thing, it is that, that you would pray for the leaders of the church. One leader that I didn't recognize for a key role when I identified the pastors of the church is my own wife because she serves in one of the real key, and, and yes, she hates that I'm doing this right now, and I don't dare let her know in advance that I'm going to say this about her, but, but she serves in a key role in the church, and it's not just because of who she is. Every pastor's wife serves in a key role, and churches don't know what to call that. Well, I will say this, white um, evangelical churches don't know what to call that. In, it's, it's interesting. In charismatic churches, they'll frequently just identify both the husband and the wife as the pastors of the church. When I was a kid, I used to think that was so weird, and now I, I totally get it because they both serve in equally vital roles. I love how in black churches, they tend to recognize the pastor's wife as the first lady of the church. I think that's kind of a, kind of a cool uh, name for the role, and Jackie's shaking her head, so I'm probably not going to get away with that one, but uh, don't look for that on the back of your bulletin anytime soon. But the reality, and the, the part of the reason that I'm taking the time to, to just recognize that is it, um, in a couple of weeks, we'll celebrate our eighth anniversary, and one of the things that Jackie has commented to me and I, I'm so grateful that God has given me a ministry partner who fills this role really well. But one of the things that she has said from time to time to me as just an honest confession of the reality of life is she said, I didn't have all these problems with demonic attacks in my life until I married you. <laughs> that's not the punchline to a joke. I mean, it's like, that's, that's really 
serious stuff. And, and she's not joking when she says that. She's like, I didn't have to deal with a fraction of the stuff that I have to deal with until I was your wife. And I, my heart feels heavy for that. I mean, at times I just have said, I, I'm sorry. I wish there were something that I could do about that. It's a part of the package. It's a, it's a part of the deal. And I'm not saying that to go, wah, wah, I feel sorry for us. No, no, I, I say that because I'm speaking for everyone in leadership in this church and in any church Part of the reason that Paul says pray for all of those in authority is because not only has God given those in authority a special role to be able to cover others, to be a covering from the attacks of the enemy, but it also comes with a a bullseye on those in leadership that the enemy targets them that much more. So what Jackie has voiced is something that lots of people feel and experience. That's why your prayers really do matter. So thank you for that. The second thing Paul points out is the responsibility that we have to patiently guide and encourage those who are straying or struggling. Let's say that again. To guide and encourage those who are straying or struggling. He says in verse 14, We urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Okay, what Paul is talking about here is the people that we love to affectionately refer to as the EGR folks. Extra grace required. Do you have any EGRs in your life? Don't put your elbow in the side of the person sitting next to you if that's who you're thinking of. Everybody's got EGRs, right? We've, we've all got people. You love them, but you just kind of shake your head sometimes when you've been with them like, oh my goodness. It just, just takes extra with them. Everybody's got those people. And Paul said... And every church has got those people. And you've got a choice to make. You can either stay frustrated with them, or you can try and just stay away from them, or you can just welcome the fact that in a normal family, in a normal church family, this is just going to be a part of reality, and you need to know how you should respond to the EGR people in your life. So he identifies three of them. Let's take a moment to to just consider the three that he, he said that we'll come across. First of all, he says, warn those who are idle and disruptive. The New American Standard uh, says the, calls them the unruly. That word means literally in the Greek, those who are careless or out of line. It was a term that would be applied to a soldier who will not march in step with the other soldiers. As I was watching football yesterday, and we are not going to talk about that. But as I was, okay, I'll go ahead and, and say, as I was watching Tennessee's Big T, I'm looking at Forrest and his orange up here, kudos to you guys. As I'm watching, you know, the Big T at the beginning of the game, and they're all marching, and they're in this long, these long straight lines, I was thinking of this passage. It's a picture like that. If you've, if you've ever watched a marching band and one person gets out of line with everybody else, I mean, it's kind of comical and tragic all at the same time, like, oh, my goodness. You can't help but notice the one fool who just will not march in line with everyone else. And Paul said every church has got them. They just just don't want to march in line. Now, let's be really clear. In the kingdom of God, God is not trying to stamp out people who all are just cookie-cutter models who all look alike. In fact, Satan is the one who is into conformity. You've got to all look the same and, and, and trying to make you yield to peer pressure to do what everybody around you is doing. No. God is into individuality, and that's why he's built us with so much uniqueness. But even with all of our unique passions and characteristics, he calls us to come together and to yield to one another in such a way that we can march in lockstep in accomplishing his kingdom agenda. You don't have to yield your individuality to function as a team together. And it is critically important that we seek to all do that and that we offer a warning, some instruction to those who are what Paul called the unruly. Now, I want to just make a point here because here's the thing. If you are the EGR, you don't know it. (laughs) Tell me that's not a fact. It's, it's like the sin of pride. Nobody who has pride ever knows that they've got pride. And if you are the unruly, you usually don't realize that you are the unruly. 
So I'm going to meddle for just a moment. Now I'm being serious. The, one of the things that the last two and a half years has done for us has exposed that there is a very strong, unruly spirit in the church in America, and particularly among evangelicals. There's a very, very strong tendency toward an unruly spirit in the church. And here's the way that to me it's been most clearly manifest in the last two and a half years. With the sentiment that says, you can't tell me to do that. I'm an American. You can't make me do that. Now, let's be really clear. What I'm saying is not a political statement. I don't care what your politics is. I really don't. I don't care what you think about the vaccine or about COVID. I don't care. I don't care what your opinion is about those things. What I do care about is that all of us learn to recognize in ourselves when we are guilty of an unruly spirit that says, you can't tell me. You can't make me. You know what I'm talking about. you got to bob your head and put your hand on your hips when you say that. Uh-uh. You can't tell me what to do. I mean, when we watch our kids do that, what wells up in you as an adult? Oh, that's got to be broken. Every child has to learn you answer to someone. Don't you put your hands on your hips and look at me and say, uh-uh, you can't tell me. I'm the boss of me. Friends, that is not just something that happens in the lives of children. Adults struggle with an unruly spirit that says, you can't tell me. You're not the boss of me. Regardless of what your politics are, what you think about this or that, at some level, it is critically important that at every age and stage of life that we realize we're always answerable to someone. We always have to be willing to submit to someone, whether it is the federal government or in our church or in our family. We're all answerable to others. And what did Paul say that we're to do in relation to those who have an unruly spirit? He said, warn them. Why, why do we warn them? What are we warning them about? We're warning them about the danger of living in rebellion. That's what the warning is. We're warning people, when you live in rebellion, you put yourself in a very, very dangerous place. The Scripture says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, on the surface of it, that's a strange thing to say. Rebellion and witchcraft? What does rebellion have to do with witchcraft? It's very simple. Witchcraft is the fastest track train to put you in, in direct connection to the enemy, to the demonic. You start dabbling in witchcraft, you have just opened the door of your soul I mean, to, to an immediate spiritual stronghold. It's guaranteed you're going to get it. That's what witchcraft will do for you. And Paul said rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft because when you engage in rebellion, guess what you do? You move from this place of protection where you have those in authority over you protecting you from the attacks of the enemy, and rebellion says, uh-uh, I don't have to yield to you. I don't have to listen to you. I'm my own person. Guess where we are now? We're in position to receive whatever the enemy wants to dump on us and do to us. Paul says, warn them. It is a dangerous thing to live in in a place of isolation where you don't submit to anyone. It's why it's so important to belong to a family of faith, to belong to a small group, to be in a place where you have all those layers of covering over you. It's why it's important to belong to a family. It's great to be a child. It's great to be a wife. It's great to be in a place where somebody else covers you, and they are the first line of defense. Does that make sense? He says, warn those who are unruly. The second thing that he says is to encourage the disheartened. That word is also translated as faint-hearted. The word means literally the little-souled. And this is not about weak people. The, the word is applied to those who tend to be um, really pessimistic. These are the, the glass-half-empty people. They're always imagining how this is going to go badly, and they tend to be the quicker ones to give up, to just be ready to quit. And Paul says, in relation to them, what you need to do is, instead of just going, we'll get lost. You know, if, if you want to quit, quit. Go home. 
He says, no, comfort them, encourage them. The word in the Greek that he used is it's a um, two-part word, para muthos. Para means near, and muthos means speech. And what it means literally is for those who are, who are always discouraged and ready to give up, he says, draw near to speak softly, to encourage them. If you've been around here, you know Jackie and I, uh, we like some reality TV shows. We love Survivor, and we love um, another one that we love is The Amazing Race. And if you're watching the current season of The Amazing Race, in the last two episodes, there's one father-daughter couple in this thing. And uh, while I'm, I'm fascinated by the show, I'm like, I don't think I'd want to do it. It really stretches you to your limits. And so th this father-daughter combo that are immigrants from one of the island countries of the Caribbean, and you can tell from the get-go, the dad's just there because his daughter wanted to do it, and he just wanted to support his daughter and share an experience with his daughter. So it's really all about her. But in the last two episodes, it's a mega leg, and it's just they've been through so much stuff in one 12-hour span, and they're, everybody's so exhausted, but they're nearing the finish line of that phase and the daughter just gives up. She is just out of gas. And the last one to get to, to the finish line for that leg is eliminated. They send you back to the States. You lose your chance on the million dollars. And you just see it the moment it happens. This, this girl, she's just like, I am done. I just want to go home. I'm finished. And it's like no matter what the dad says, he can't get his daughter to stop feeling this way. He's like, we're so near the, the next finish line. Come on, we can, you know, we're not in last place. We can make it. And she's just like, I don't want it. I don't want to finish. I want to go home. I'm just, I'm, I'm just done. And so, you know, they're both carrying heavy backpacks, and they've just got just a little more to do. And, and, and he finally, he takes his, and though he's not a young man, he takes her backpack as well as his own. And now he's carrying two backpacks. And at every point along the way, it's like she's just dragging her feet. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I just want to go home. And he, but he's just urging her and speaking gently to her and bringing her along. And he almost has to drag her across the finish line. But the bottom line is they get there. And I just thought watching that, I'm like, that's a picture of what Paul is talking about. There are just going to be people who just, who just give out of gas. And in fact... We're all going to have moments when our tank is on empty and where we don't want to keep on. And we always are going to need somebody in our lives that's going to put an arm around us and go, don't give up. Don't give up. I, I know you're tired. I, I know this has been a hard season, and I know you don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. But come on. We're going to hang on to you. You're going to make it. Draw near and speak softly is what he says for those who are who are small-souled, who are faint-hearted. And then the last ones that he identifies are the weak. He says, uh, help the weak, those who are spiritually weak. and who. It's interesting when you think about those who are the spiritually the weakest, what we tend to do if that's who we are, that we'll usually go to one extreme or the other. Those who are the least developed spiritually will usually either err toward license or legalism. Have you ever noticed that? We won't find a good balance usually when we're spiritually not mature yet. We'll either, when I say license, when we either err toward license of feeling like that we can do things that we really don't have any business doing, that a believer does not have any business saying or doing or being in that relationship, but they feel like they've got the liberty to do that. Or just as frequently, young believers, those who are immature in the faith, will err toward legalism. That life is simpler if we just have a list of rules to go by and they'll want to just boil everything down to just a list of black and white rules. And that is not what Christianity is. It's about a dynamic relationship with a living person. And what Paul says about those, regardless of which way they land, those who are weak, the line is literally hold fast to the weak. Just don't let them fall. You've got to hold on to them and give them time to grow up in the faith. In Galatians 6, 1, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, if someone in your group does something wrong, you who are spiritual should go to that person and gently make them help make them right again. You know, belonging to a group puts you in a position to allow that to happen. Because here's the thing that we don't like to acknowledge even to ourselves. Every one of us are going to be that person sometimes. Sometime along the way, 
we're going to be the weak one. Sometimes we're going to be the discouraged one. And when you belong, there's somebody that's going to be close enough to you to hold on to you and pull you along or even speak words of correction. And that's the picture that Paul is painting. We're all going to be the EGR at times. And then the final word is this. Constantly pursue peace and unity within the church. He said, live in peace with each other. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Paul echoes this sentiment, amplifies it in Ephesians 4, 2, and 3, when he says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love, and make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. It is a picture of, of real unity within the family, but the word that Paul gives that's so realistic is he says, make every effort to have unity within this family of faith. Don't we just love to imagine that unity just always happens automatically, that if, if we love Jesus, we're just all going to get along great, that every marriage is going to be happy and every small group is going to get along and every church is just going to be unified. Wouldn't you love to visit that universe? Wouldn't you love to be in that family? I mean, it doesn't just happen by itself, does it? I mean, everybody in the room that is married and thinks that this just all happens magically by itself, we look forward to you experiencing your second week of marriage, right? Because <laughs> you haven't been married very long. I mean, it doesn't just happen by itself. You have to work hard at unity in your marriage, in your family, and in your church family. Now, I would make this observation. Unity is uh, one of those things that is a great deal like humility. I I'm sort of amused that on different occasions along the way, I've had people make comments to me that are like, you know, what I'm really focused on in my life right now is humility. I'm just really working hard at growing my own humility. And I always want to laugh when I hear somebody say something like that and go, report back to me in six months and let me know how that's going. Because I'll guarantee you, if that's what you're doing, you're failing. Because you never get humility that way. I mean, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. So if I go, right now, I'm just going to focus on me having more humility. I mean, you realize that, like the insanity of that statement. I'm just working so hard at being more humble. It, it never works that way. Humility is the, is the natural byproduct of getting things in proper perspective where I'm really focused on loving God and loving others. And guess what happens as a result of that? I'm less focused on me. And humility is the natural byproduct of that. Unity is the same way. Like, if we want unity in the church or in our family or whatever, let me tell you what you don't do. We don't do a six-month study on unity because what we'll probably have at the end of that is a church fight. You know, I mean, it, it doesn't work that way. You don't, you don't get unity by studying unity and, and that kind of direct approach. Unity is the natural, healthy byproduct of some other things. And I'll mention three things that I think foster unity in a big way. The first one is worship. You can have people who have a wide range of opinions and passions and, and personality types who wouldn't just naturally just want to hang out together, but you put them in an environment where Jesus is at the center of everything and we are just declaring the greatness and the goodness of Jesus. And as we just focus on him and celebrate him together, it, it's crazy how we see each other differently. I mean, as we were worshiping today, and I'm focusing on the Lord, but I start looking around at y'all. And my heart is just overflowing with joy. And I was remembering two and a half years ago when we'd come in here every Sunday, and there would only be five of us in the room because we were all in lockdown. The only ones of us that were here were the ones that had to be here and Tony's singing to an empty room and a camera, and I'm preaching to an essentially empty room and a, and a camera. And I look around the room, and I'm like, oh, man, a season like that, I miss you so badly. I am so, so grateful for you. And as I, just, as I worship with you, I don't know how to explain it other than I like you a lot more when we're worshiping. I mean, I like you all the time. I love you all the time. But I love you more when we're worshiping. Something just happens. Worship does that mission does that 
You can take two people whose personalities are so diametrically opposed to each other, but you put them in a situation that really takes you to the limit to reach others, to make a difference, to be on the front lines. And I will tell you, you will no longer care about the things that used to bother you about that person. You'll just be so grateful to have them beside you. I can't help but think back to the three trips over the years that I've taken to East Central Africa. And those are intense trips. They're always 16-day trips. Everything about them is extreme. The, the level of exhaustion, the length of the days, the, how rigorous, and no running water, no electricity. I mean, it's so rigorous. And, and the opposition by the black magic practitioners and the Muslims. I mean, it is so intense. And of all things, so, I mean, you've got all that to deal with. And God puts us together on a team where it's not just members from our church, but it's some people from some other churches and two of these people, I mean, the first trip right off the bat, I just realized, y'all are going to drive me crazy in 16 days. I mean, I'm glad Jesus loves you because I'm not even sure I like you. I mean, I, I'm sorry. It's just, you ever feel that way? And you're like, what a terrible person you are. I am sometimes. That's why I need Jesus and grace. But, I mean, one of them is a, is a man, and he's another pastor. And I'm like, good grief, I want to kill you. He just, <laughs> it just hyper-spiritualizes everything, and he's got an opinion about everything, and if he feels strongly about it, that has to be Jesus' opinion, and I just want to go, in the name of Jesus, shut up, please, we're going to do this for 16 days. So there's him, and then there's this woman that makes him look like a saint. She just, my goodness, I mean, there, aren't there people you ever meet that you think, come on, Jesus, even you struggle sometimes loving this person? <laughs> it, it was hard. To start with, and I'm just thinking, I don't know that I can do these trips with this individual. And as we get on the front lines, and we are getting stretched to the limit, and I see these two individuals who personally drive me crazy, you know what happens? I develop so quickly such a deep appreciation for and love for them that even though their personalities are so different from mine, or maybe they're, maybe they're like me and I just don't know. Maybe that's the problem. I don't know, but... But even though they in the natural drive me crazy, this happens to our hearts as we serve the Lord together. We didn't do a Bible study on unity. We got on the front lines doing ministry and unity as the natural result. The one other thing that I'll mention that develops unity is just doing community together. Doing life together. You know, we talk about small groups a lot around here. And I just want you to know... We don't just talk about it. We live it. Jackie and I love that we belong. I love that I'm in a small group, and I love my small group. And it amazes me how quickly each year when God brings new people into the group, how quickly you just fall in love with the new people in the group, and you're like, y'all have got to stay with us. You can't go to another group because you just suddenly, as you start sharing life together, you just learn to love these people deeply. And I know on the surface of things like what we're going to do this afternoon with the fall tailgate event may look like, eh, that's just kind of fluff. Sunday morning is the main thing, but that's kind of a fluff event. And I don't feel that way at all because it is important that we just create opportunities to do life together. It's important that John and Rick and Laura and their group get to make chocolate-covered bacon for the rest of us because it bonds us together. That's why they won last time, by the way. It was the chocolate-covered bacon you bring pork on the scene, and it's, but we've got sausage this year, so get ready. But seriously, we, just sharing the fun stuff in life, where, where it's not all heavy, that we just laugh and, and enjoy one another. Community brings us together. And you know, one of the experiences of community that we share is this thing that sounds a lot like community, communion. Communion is always about coming together. It's about union with Christ, but it's also about the union that we share with one another. The wonderful equalizer at the table is the recognition that we are all broken, lost sinners in desperate need of a Savior. And if it were not for the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus, every person in the room from the best and most successful to the most low-down lost sinner is equally lost and undone.
It's just level ground at the foot of the cross. And so when we come to the table, we celebrate the goodness of Jesus and our desperate need for him and for his grace every day. But we celebrate that we don't come to the table alone, that we share this in community, that this was God's purpose in creation, to form for himself a family of faith. Not all of these one and only children. There are no only children in the family of God. It's just this big circle of brothers and sisters who are called to learn to do life together well. We have to work at it, don't we? It's fun. It's an adventure. It stretches us. But aren't you glad that we get to share in that together? And at the center of it all is our Lord Jesus who has made it all possible. Would you join me as we turn to him together in prayer right now? God, you are so good. You express your goodness to us in a multitude of ways. But above everything else, you demonstrate your goodness and your love through your son, our Lord Jesus. And we celebrate him today. Jesus, there's never been a day of our lives that you haven't shown us kindness, favor, and mercy. And we give you thanks for every one of those things. But above everything, you've shown us the depth of your love with your passion, with your suffering and your death. We recognize that nothing that we could do would ever make us right with you. You did for us what we could not do for ourselves with your death on the cross and your resurrection. And we give you thanks for that today. Why don't you just from your own heart, just give thanks to Jesus for that that he died for you, that he has paid for your sin. Why don't you ask that in a fresh way that be applied to your life, that his blood cover your sin. Would you give thanks today that Jesus has made for you a new and living way that you have access to the Father? Jesus, we thank you for these things. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for fellowship restored with the Father. Thank you for the fellowship that we share together. And now as we come to the table, we acknowledge our desperation and our need, and we ask you to come and meet us and to fill us up with yourself, with your life. We pause now and remember, Lord Jesus, how on the night that you were betrayed, just hours before the cross, how you took bread and broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Jesus, thank you for your precious body and for all that it endured. We remember how after supper you took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we remember your blood that was shed, that purchased our pardon. We give you thanks. Would you meet us in this time? Even as we come to receive, would you encourage us? Would you bind up broken hearts? Would you release those in bondage? Would you heal the sick here today? Holy Spirit, we welcome your work, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I surely hope that what you heard was relevant and helpful and above everything. I hope that what you experienced today really helped your heart to connect with the heart of God. Now, if what you heard uh, for you stirred up any questions or maybe led you toward uh, some type of spiritual decision, maybe you want to talk with someone about something that's on your mind, I would love to hear from you. And so I would encourage you, reach out by email. At the bottom of the screen, you see my email address. It's mark at myfreedomchurch.net. That's not going to go to a secretary or an assistant. That will come directly to me. I'd love to hear from you and talk with you about anything that's on your mind. And if in the future you're in our area, we would love for you to come and worship with us at Freedom Church. But until then, we invite you to access all of the sermon material that you find online. Again, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Hope that you have a great day.